Thanks, Chris. To be continued. Neil, you wrote a novel with Terry Pratchett. How did Good Omens compare to writing a monthly comic? Writing Good Omens, it was great. You know, we were th by, the way, by the time we were three quarters of the way through writing the book, we knew what it was all about. We went back to chapter one and inserted all those things that made it look like we knew what we were doing all the way along. You can do it in a novel, it's great. You know, you write yourself through and, and suddenly you realize what you were saying back there or you realize that was wrong, so you can go back and just throw that away and replace it with a scene that'll make the end work. No problem. The comics, you can't do that. The first chapter's been on the stands for three months. Thanks, Neil. Nancy, what's next? Oh, okay. Nancy, kill the chroma. While a short story is the cutting edge of speculative fiction, in comics, it's the black and white alternatives. In black and white's diversity is the key. Small runs, sometimes self-published. Dangerous topics, weird humor. One of the most highly acclaimed is Love and Rockets by Gilbert and Jaime Hernandez. Beto, it's Commander Rick. Why do you guys work in black and white? Well, originally, it was for economic reasons. It's just very difficult to put out a color comic book and get your money back and have it pay for itself, blah, blah, blah. A lot of the colors don't turn out right. You know, just technical stuff. But it was originally uh, economic reasons, but uh, we've just grown so accustomed to it that uh, we prefer it now. I enjoy working in black and white because even when I do color comic books, I don't color them, not for the most part. I colored the cover for Critters 34 with Teddy Payne on it and I colored the covers for Sticks Inferno. But um, I, since I work in black and white, I draw like this and send them off to someone else to color them. I tend to think always of doing the work as best I can in black and white. And uh, often, I, en I enjoy the way it looks in this form that I want to see it published in that form, you know, so that the public gets to sort of see the work the way I wanted it presented. Um, the second reason is probably the far more important one of the two. Uh, independent publishers don't have the money to publish in color. There just isn't enough of a purchasing public out there to support a color independent comic book. Sad, but true. A while back, I talked to Kevin Eastman about the problems that he and Peter Laird encountered trying to get their little black and white comic book published. You know, I had a, a $500 income tax return. Pete had a couple hundred dollars in the bank. And I had an uncle that worked uh, uh, in this art supply store that was, you know, we could just see great cheap art supplies. And he was always interested in what we were doing. Um, we more or less conned him out of $700, which gave us enough money to um, literally do a, a press run of 3,000 copies, run one ad in the Comics Buyer's Guide. Uh, we were going to sell all the, the copies, single copy through the mail, uh, $1.50 plus postage. There was this ongoing argument where, you know, uh, Pete and I had where it was cheaper to do 3,000 than 1,000. I only wanted to do 1,000 because it was all our money, and I didn't think we'd sell 1,000, you know, and 3,000. I was like, oh, man. So, you know, again, taking the idea that we'd take it directly to the marketplace, whether it was mail order, taking it to conventions and stuff ourselves. And when I say we bumbled into the business where we sort of started getting these calls from distributors saying we'd like to carry a book. Um, and, you know, we said, oh, okay, well, you know, you can buy it. You know, you see, it's a cover price. It's $1.50. Uh, we'll sell it to you for $1.40 or, or something. And they're like, no, 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 no. That's not how we work this, son. Uh, we have 60% off cover and blah, 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 blah. And, um, you know, it worked out that we only made, you know, we're 60% off cover. Uh, the books cost us 45 cents or something a piece, um, you know. But the idea of selling them all to distributors was that getting them out of our living room, you know, trying to hide them with, with doilies and things um, to distributors and getting them out there and making a couple hundred books, at least they'd be gone and would do it. And so that's what we did. And now the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are out selling food. Kevin and Peter can afford to publish the Turtles comic in color. Heck, they could afford leather covers and gold inlay lettering, but they still prefer the look of black and white. Some of my favorite comics are alternatives. Check out Concrete by Paul Chadwick or Eight Ball by Dan Close. The best alternatives have one thing in common. They're completely novel. The novel, of course, uh, gives you room to examine larger things, uh, social and technological changes, uh, and, and, and gives you an opportunity to work against a landscape. It gives you room to set up a world. In regular fiction, I'm tempted to say ordinary or mimetic fiction, um, life is too easy. You don't have to explain what a car is. You know, he, he turned the switch on his Ferrari 
and put the metal, you know, the pedal to the metal. You know what happens. Um, all of this must be done ab initio, from the very beginning uh, in science fiction. It takes space. It's an art form to compress how much space it takes. Science fiction writer Robert A. Heinlein was the master of the brisk novel. He could conjure up the future with a simple phrase like he walked up and the door dilated, bang, the future. These days, compression is a forgotten art with everyone churning out huge tomes or trilogies, especially in fantasy fiction. I mean, Nancy, I was on a roll. Now I've lost, I thought, where was I? Right, the trilogy, or the quadrilogy, or the heptilogy. Guy Gabriel Kay wrote a trilogy called the Fionavar Tapestry, but he got his start in fantasy writing when he was asked to help complete J.R.R. Tolkien's posthumous book, The Silmarillion. Guy, it's Commander Rick. Why has the trilogy become almost a standard form in modern fantasy fiction? Works tend to fall into certain patterns after a while, simply because previous works did. Uh, the Lord of the Rings, as you probably know, was an accidental trilogy. It was not written as a trilogy. It was broken arbitrarily. It was made a trilogy because of a paper shortage and the costs of printing in post-war Britain. Uh, after The Lord of the Rings, there would have been, I think, a certain emphasis on repeating the patterns of the master, as it were. But Guy, surely not every fantasy story idea can hold up for three books. The uh, occupational hazard of science fiction and fantasy seems to me to be the writer who goes back to the well once too often. There's a great deal of pressure to repeat when you've succeeded with one book, to simply do it again, and from the readers, from your publishers, from your agents. And I think that that's probably depth to the creative process for any writer. My first two books, which were, it was a two book series, there is no third book. Someone came in the other day to the store, I was shelving books, and he came by and he said, I really like the first two books in the Crystal series, when's the third one coming out? And I said, and everybody who, who hasn't read the first two books must now turn off their televisions. <laughs> and I said, she dies in the end of book two. And he says, well, yeah, I know. And waited. <laughs> so I, I had to explain to him that there could not be a third book because there was no longer a character to write the books about. He seemed quite upset about that. She loves everything he ever wrote. I'd love to stay here and chat, but I'm right at the end, and I gotta find out what happens. Except this. You dirty bird. How could you? Misery Chastain cannot be dead. You murdered us! When Ian realized that the reason they'd buried Misery alive was because the beasting had put her in that temporary coma, and when Gravedigger Wilkes remembered how 30 years earlier the same thing had happened to Lady Evelyn Hyde? Oh, and then old Dr. Cleary deduced that misery must be Lady Evelyn Hyde's long-lost daughter because of the rarity of deadly bee stings, my heart just leapt! <laughs> I've known from the very first book that misery had to be born of nobility, and I was right. Yeah. Oh, Paul, can I read each chapter when you finish? I can fill in the ends. Will she be her old self now that Ian has dug her out, or will she have amnesia? I have to wait. Will she still love him with that special, perfect love? You'll have to wait. Not even a hint? Mm -hmm. Oh, misery's alive! Misery's alive! Oh, it's so romantic! Oh, this whole house is gonna be filled with romance! Oh, I'm gonna put on my Liberace records. Tanya, why are trilogies and series suddenly so popular? Television. It's seriously, no, people sit down once a week and they, they want the same thing every week at the same time. And that's what they want from their books. They want the same thing at the same week. You know, not everybody, admittedly, but a good portion of the people out there who buy books, they want the same thing at the same time. Like once a month they come in, they buy the Star Trek novel. Once a month they come in, they buy the Conan novel. And those plots haven't changed since Howard died in the 30s. Uh, it has, it's the same drawback as the, uh, the uh, uh, television series, like, like Star Trek, where you know that nothing terribly significant can happen to the characters because they would be changed forever and wouldn't come back as themselves the following episode. Um, uh, my, personally, I believe that series novels are just not artistic. They're not novels in, in the usual sense that we, we mean a novel.